Thank you so much for joining today in our series of webinars. Um, today I have, uh, my name is Manish Sharma and I'm going to be your host today. We have a very exciting webinar uh, lined up and very exciting participants in the webinar. So uh, let me, uh, you know, introduce uh, my co-panelist. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, senior analyst for Forrester, Will uh, McInvite. He's, he's a a very insightful analyst who's been researching in the areas of Gen AI, IT service management, um, and employee uh, support at large. Uh, I enjoy reading his research. Um, I love how he can sort through so many things that are, you know, so many technology changes and so many trends that are coming in, sort through them and ability to, to narrow down on the things that really matter to all of us in the space of IT service management. Uh, so, Will, welcome to the uh, to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rinish. And I'm just going to see if I can take control here or um, share screen. And and while you do that, let me let me also introduce our co-panelist, Asan. Hi, Asan. Uh, welcome to the discussion today. It's a very exciting uh, topic, and. Um, and to to people who don't know Asan, he's a CIO and CTO role at uh, at uh, uh, you know AC Transit, um, he's very passionate about uh, uh, you know um, all things related to service and service delivery. He is responsible for the IT strategy, a technology strategy for the organization. But also, I have found over interacting with him over the years, he's very passionate about the service delivery that happens to the employees and then to the customers. Right. Um, so uh, I've seen an innovative streak in him. He has um, deployed solutions which are different from. From others, he has taken initiatives, in, and he, he and his organization have taken initiatives uh, in order to bring the right service to the to the customer. So, welcome, Asan. Uh, uh, very glad to have you here today. Glad to be here, Manish. Thanks. Thanks. Fantastic. Will, over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, let me know if, when you can see my screen. And for the record, I'm actually more excited for Asan's bit than my own. Uh, but thank you for having me, and thank you everybody so much on the line for joining us here today. Um, we've got a, a little bit too much content, in all honesty, mostly my fault, uh, on this topic that we're really quite excited to share with you, um, covering a number of different topics from uh, just where things are in the market, what state of adoption we're on, talking a bit about the areas under transformation, how is integrated in or how is integrating generative AI going to be transforming things like even Microsoft Teams and uh, what is the future technologies we're going to be looking at here today. But we've also then got uh, Asan joining us for to talk about some of the real life experiences of his own when implementing this stuff, as well as uh, Manish will be presenting a bit on uh, resolve his perspective on these capabilities. But uh, one thing we do really want to reinforce during this presentation is please ask questions. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot and want to make sure this is useful to you and helpful to you in your jobs. So there's really two options. Um, I prefer folks use the Q&A one, but even if you just want to ping us directly in chat, we'll be watching out for that. So any question comes up at any point during our uh, conversation here, please reach out, ask us questions. We're here for you, even outside of the dedicated Q&A section. But to start today's discussion, um, there's been a lot of talk in the market around generative AI, what it's doing, where it's going to be apl applied, but what is the actual state of adoption in organizations has always been a little bit um, ephemeral to track. And so a few months ago, Forrester actually took some steps in order to figure out where are organizations actually using this? What is the actual concrete state of this today? And we can fairly confidently share at this point that we're now moving into early adoption. We're not totally there yet, but over 66% of decision makers and organizations who are um, working with these systems reported now expanding the use or experimenting actively with generative AI in production today. Uh, so we've moved past the early education stage where we are moving through experimentation and bringing these products into production. And now we actually see these solutions 
in the hands of employees. And we're primarily employing these when it comes to employee productivity and stuff like knowledge management, which will be very relevant later on. Um, but we're also implementing a number of other use cases or still bringing online a number of other use cases, the more advanced ones like Turing bots and software development, um, actual marketing and content creation, collateral creation. And then customer self-service is a little bit of a uh, lagging category here because this is a bit harder to do and a little bit more higher stakes because um, if you give your customers wrong information, this might be a little bit more difficult to remediate than uh, an employee having a date slightly wrong. But when it comes to the overall generative space, a lot of people think of Gen AI as just the large language model itself. Um, so something like OpenAI's GPT-4, for example. And while these systems are basically <laughs> minor miracles um, from coming from somebody who's been watching this for a while, what they can do is nothing short of astonishing. But when I say Gen AI system, this is more than just the large language model itself. Any effective or enterprise ready Gen AI system that we see being actually implemented in an organization today is made up not just of the large language model, but also it has to be able to take action. Uh, so large language models are useful for understanding what somebody's asking and responding to that, um, hopefully accurately. But the model itself might not have appropriate information, like what is uh, Forrester's holiday policy? or what are our holidays for the year of 2025? That's not something I expect um, OpenAI to be able to know innately. So you need the ability to not only connect a large language model to underpinning information, but then to go and take action on it as well. Because if I'm wondering if there's a specific holiday and I want to go and um, take leave in the case in which that's not actually a holiday that we have off, that's something that you need additional systems on. You need the ability to understand language, you need to be able to take action, you need to be able to process that data and pull the right information, you need to be able to protect your systems and clean things and protect from um, more malicious attacks like an SQL injection or more incidental information. Like if somebody decides to share their social security number, you don't wanna be retaining that. And then at the end of the day, you need the ability to rearticulate and answer them back. But moving all these things together is one more piece of this, or one last piece of this equation, I should say, which is the orchestration layer, which determines what happens when. So uh, gen generative systems and generative language models are themselves already a miracle. And what we're seeing coming online in production is even one step further than that in nothing short of uh, I, I don't necessarily want to say black magic, but we're getting pretty close to that. And it's a good thing too, because when it comes to employing the, um, and something like employee support, there's a lot of opportunity here. Because today, the employee support journey is one that I would describe as um, frictionful. And I'll be saying the word friction a lot, and I apologize in advance, uh, but this is a very important principle relating to all this. So in today's employee support journey, we do not do a very good job of removing friction from end users. And while employees are actually fairly optimistic and fairly positive when it comes to interacting with the human side of this equation, um, our processes and the way that we have set up support itself today is not meeting employee expectation because 62% of employees say they avoid the service desk and 60% say that they're living with issues that the service desk cannot fix. That is not great. That is over a failure and organizations fundamentally need help in order to actually live up to these employee expectations. And so in building a plan for what you should be doing today, where should humans be helping, where should you be focusing on automation, um, we actually went and pulled some data on this. Because primarily what we see today and where we recommend using um, actually existing automation systems and language conversational AI enabled systems today is for the more simple stuff. The more complicated stuff will be coming in the very near future, stuff like fixing broken devices and detecting outages before they occur. But stuff like password resets, software provisioning and access requests, um, understanding basic 
elements of like how Outlook or Word or Excel work, even getting stuff like peripherals or even getting a piece of new hardware or a new device or getting assistance with that uh, or getting that provisioned, employee ad drops. These are all the things that should be automated today. And so in laying out an equation to give you sort of a trajectory for how to start doing this, there's two sides of this equation. There's improving accelerating the support experience, which is where generative is actively helping with today, and avoiding the need for support entirely, which is where generative will be being employed tomorrow. All of this leads in total to a better employee experience. And the preliminary results we've seen from organizations who have been experimenting with this over time is pretty promising. Uh, we see on average about 20 to 40% deflection being achieved today with some um, seeing even higher thanks to some uh, extraneous circumstances relating to But we believe it's an appropriate target for organizations to shoot for that 40% automation in the future. There's of course some caveats to that, more than happy to get into those, um, especially during Q&A time. But this is in no small part thanks to Gen AI today and how it's going to be employed and how you should be employing it in order to accelerate all this work and reduce these points of friction that employees are experiencing. Because when it comes to just even basic understanding of how things work in the organization, documentation and similar, uh, we've unfortunately punted on all of this. You, if you ask anybody in your organization who is primarily responsible for knowledge management, you are lucky if you have an individual, which is remarkable considering how much knowledge we need in order to do our work. And so, um, in part because we've undervalued this and because it's so important to the support experience, we see Gen AI being extremely helpful for doing things like shoring up those knowledge gaps and reducing the amount of time it actually takes to generate said knowledge. Um, but even more than just the actual uh, knowledge formalization, processing, creation stuff that goes on, we see this also starting to unlock informal sources of knowledge. Because if you're doing incident remediation or if you are on a long running project, um, there are dozens of different sources of informal or tribal knowledge that crop up all across the organization. This could be just a Slack channel. This could be a, um, a small confluence instance that you've brought online in order to uh, get an agile team up and running. These are distributed across any organization today and hold some of the most important information that organizations have access to. And by and large, people don't know it exists and don't know to necessarily formalize it. And so what we start to see is the idea almost of a dynamic knowledge system, where instead of relying exclusively on formalized pieces or articles, we can move to a much more actually agile enterprise knowledge management posture, which um, previously for most organizations was only more of a pipe dream, not necessarily inachievable, but extremely hard to actually implement. And today we start to, we're starting to see this actively becoming a reality that organizations understand that they can achieve. But even moving just beyond sort of the, I have a question and I want to know something part of this equation. There's sort of three pillars to employee support. There's a, I want to know something. There's the, I need help with something and I need to um, report that something is broken or I need something and I need to report that something's broken. And conversational ticketing is one of the ways to shore up all three components of that because uh, previously, or I mean, just even now today, most organizations ticketing systems are, um, extremely reliant on knowledge and I'll say organizational uh, lines of reporting understanding on part of the end user. Um, we've effectively inflicted our org charts on all of our employees. And that's not necessarily something that translates very well, because if somebody thinks I'm just having a problem with my device, they don't know what is actually going wrong under the hood and they might not be able to well articulate it. Um, one of my favorite examples of this uh, uh, gap between employee understanding and organizational support understanding is something I call the blue taco problem because a customer came to 
a IT shop with a ticket, my taco isn't blue. What they ultimately meant by this was that they needed a password reset request. So there's a bit of a gap in terms of how employees think of a problem and what the actual underlying and your understanding of that problem is. And everybody on the line probably has their own similar example to said blue taco problem, but this is something that we're continuously fighting up against. And so to better gain understanding of what is actually the problem, you need something that can ask questions. You need something that can help automate some of the resolution here. You need something that can also then provide your employees with the accurate information. So this is how we see conversational ticketing starting to come online, enabling more of a conversation and less of an um, optimistic order taking approach, which will lead to fewer common tickets. It increases the agent context. It reduces the time people spend in queues, it reduces firefighting, and it can even start to do things like increase the amount of tickets that humans don't even need to touch. Because when we're looking at the spread of how this is all falling out in an organization, but be um, using that earlier example of the password reset, fixing a broken device spectrum, uh, for all of these types of more common requests down to procuring peripherals, you can almost fully automate this today, especially if you're integrating in with all the relevant systems. But stuff like porting outages and fixing a broken device is a little bit more uh, uh, difficult to fully automate until you've got the components in place. And so thanks now to generative systems, which improve the language understanding, which improve the conversational term by turn capabilities, the ability to articulate what something doesn't match to the system and to help people better guide their own answers, you can also just then fully plug those in to some backend system of action taking. You can um, expand out the coverage of these automations through stuff like the code generation that's starting to come online for these platforms. Um, you can better provide people more accurate, more granular knowledge, and you can even do things like uh, let them know what you don't know, which is suffice to say a problem that most automation tools have today. But this isn't the only part of the equation that is being improved. And so I mentioned agent productivity and improving that agent understanding as well. Um, thanks to the additional context that is now being provided, the increased accuracy, um, we're also giving agents now tools to accelerate their own capabilities and to automate certain tasks and to even bi-directionally hand off back to a chat or conversational solution. Uh, because when somebody has a problem, the priority for the help desk should always be to get, per get people that resolution faster. And you should not be, I'll say, preventing them from getting support using a uh, conversational solution they don't necessarily want to use. The way to best leverage this is to not only provide the upfront option to fully accelerate that work and fully automate that for the end users, but also ensure that your agents have tools that they can use to more accurately or faster gather information. This helps them um, actually just take remote action in systems that they otherwise might not necessarily have traditionally had access to because thanks to some of these more, um, we'll say, standard automation paths, you can create safe ways for people to go and take action that they previously, again, did not necessarily have access to. Um, and all of this creates a system where you create a virtuous cycle that not only accelerates the end user's experience here as well, but helps your agents understand what they're doing faster and provides them with more accurate, more in context, and um, more powerful automations. Because fundamentally, my apologies there, fundamentally with AI and with generative systems, collaboration is becoming work. There's been a few different points of impediment that we've been running into. Um, I'll say the primary one I see in most organizations is usually the lack of time to go and create an automation or to expand or iterate upon an automation or lack of knowledge to answer questions. Thanks to these new generous systems, you can inject AI both into the common conversation element of this. You can accept, you can actually improve the language understanding and competencies of the bot underpinning all of these, and even how different backend systems talk to each other. Uh, 
Uh, we've started to see this becoming more and more widely known, uh, but even just transforming information, if you're in something like an Excel sheet and putting this into an email, uh, all of these radically transform and accelerate work today. But this is just the first stage of this and where we're seeing the market moving into the future is not just expanding on all of this, but making how fast this happens incredibly quick. Because while we see usually conversation being one of the focal points of these primary implementations, generative AI is very rapidly becoming more than conversations. Because not only are you doing things now, also like automation building and workflow generation to help with your stuff like automation coverage gaps, uh, you can do alert summarization. And so you can actually start to get a better understanding of what is actually happening in your technical systems, which allows you to reduce the amount of firefighting, which allows you to become much more proactive and avoid issues being inflicted on your end users entirely. Uh, you can get more accurate information from more different sources using things like NQL or natural language querying, which is able to increasingly automate uh, construction of SQL calls um, and even let you see what you're asking and troubleshoot that itself. Um, you can even do things like natural language interfaces, which can help aggregate and concentrate work into one single area, which we already sort of saw with AI getting embedded in all these different centers of work. And next, next picks excuse me, next best action engines are even starting to appear today. Because as I said earlier, uh, generative is more than just the large language model. It's everything here. It is the language understanding, it is the action taking, and it is the data uh, and data articulation and polling. So when you have something that can start to understand what has to happen next and can create options, for you on that, and then you can tell it to execute on that. The amount of work reduction it, involved in all of these processes is nothing short of remarkable. And this opens us up to the option of capabilities like document as policy or document as code, because everything I've said so far is pretty interesting. But if you're one of the people actually implementing this, you need to make sure it's going to be working right. You need to ensure that there is um, appropriate automations being suggested and that things are being remediated in an appropriate fashion. Now you can do something like just tell it what to do in a workflow. Or you can say what has to happen or this is the sequence of events that you want to occur here. Uh, because you can create workflows directly from stuff like natural language. And this helps you even totally abstract out some of the workflow development. And I, I wanted to also note, this seems a little bit fantastical, but I have now actively seen some of these systems already in production that usually a little bit um, earlier in the part of the actual customers I've talked with. But when it comes to what is possible here, we see this very, very rapidly uh, maturing. One of the more complicated parts of this problem, though, and where generative is going to need a bit of assistance and other underpinning systems, however, is on the signal collection correlation identification side of this equation. Because when it comes to proactively identifying problems, you can do stuff like signal processing, or I should say um, alert processing. But when it comes to understanding what is actually underpinning and what is making these things go wrong, this gets a little bit trickier. And when you've got an information correlation problem, this gets extremely difficult to parse. And so the next stage that we see being laid out is not just a generative system, but a self-propelling generative system underpinned by some signal correlation engine. Um, this is both for stuff like querying and natural language querying, both for providing end users with more accurate or relevant information, like what is the status of this account? That is something that you need a much more advanced signal processing capability for, or I should say um, uh, 
accurate information identification capability. But when you pair that with something that can generate a workflow based on a Word doc or can more rapidly ingest and understand all of the knowledge in an organization, you get to a system that starts to become almost self-propelling, which eases up both your time, it allows you to be more effective with those automations and allows you to better serve customers that have been, um, we'll say patiently waiting for an improvement in their experiences up until today. So <laughs> in short, what's the future of Gen AI in the service desk? Quite a bit. But to, here, to talk a little bit more about what this is looking like in their own organization today is uh, CIO of AC Transit, Asan. Over to you. All right, thank you so much, Will. Uh, again, uh, Manish, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'm really grateful to all the audience who are participating as uh, Will uh, talked about. Uh, I really enjoyed his conversation and his, uh, his articles all the time. Uh, there's a great opportunity to learn what we are embarking on as far as uh, Gen AI is concerned. And uh, we are all experimenting and we are in the early adoption stages and phases. And uh, same thing, you know, with AC Transit. Uh, and uh, as Will mentioned earlier, we'd love to see your comments and feedback. Uh, all the audience who are participating and listening to our conversation, we want to make it more conversational and uh, Q&A. So let me start with uh, talk about AC Transit first. So uh, we are Alameda Contra Costa County. Uh, transit system. We are headquartered in uh, Oakland. Uh, we serve the two counties, Alameda and Contra Costa. And uh, I guess from my perspective, uh, Manish was talking about the passion and talking about really the, the pride you know, we have in our service to our customers. 60% uh, of our riders are below poverty line. 40% of our riders are are public transit dependent. They do not even own a car. So when you're looking at that kind of a customer base, you know, 1.6 million uh, citizens and, and uh, residents in the two county system, uh, heavily relying on our public transit mobility services and the people who are providing these services, the frontline staff, uh, which is 60%, uh, they, they don't have, you know, the access to the help desk, you know, from the IT perspective. So we started looking into defining what is the business need, what is the business problem. The very first thing pops up is, of course, you know, we don't have twenty-four by seven IT service desk in AC Transit. I don't have that uh, that infrastructure in place. We started looking into how do we cater to the needs of after-hours, you know, support addressing the need of our our frontline staff who are coming uh, around the clock because we have. Uh, 24 by you know seven service. A lot of times they're looking for service, they're looking for help. And they have been relying, our frontline staff, they've been relying on their supervisors or calling help desk or sending a note or an email and waiting after 5 p.m. Uh, that they can they can get the help for next day. But let's say if someone is working, you know, after hours, that, that you know, his or her shift, then it's going to really becoming a problem or a challenge. Uh, someone just need to find out, you know, what is the what is the policy? How do I get the, the knowledge or what could be done? So... We started looking into really more and more self-serve leveraging some of these technologies, but we wanted to make sure that we can provide efficiently. We can provide keeping the the customer experience uh, in in tech, you know, from that perspective, offering another channel that we can provide this information in much easier way, like you know, Will was talking about from the NLQ NLP perspective, or of course our our intent was to increase the the resolution time. So again, rather than relying on, on someone to show up next day from the help desk to offer those services, uh, we wanted to make sure that we have technology, we have the system available, that we can have a much better response time. And a lot of these questions, a lot of these queries, uh, as Will was showing in his presentation, you know, like a password reset, or where can I find the policy for VPN, or where can I, you know, get my information about uh, my email or some other some other you know very basic questions. So really helping our uh, building that sort of a culture among our employees of the customer service and, and making sure that they have the twenty four by seven support uh, that they can get the answers whenever they need it and from whatever uh, access they have they needed. Uh, that was the main 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 purpose. So 
you know, as any IT solution, you know, you typically come up with the business requirements, come up with the business, you know, the problem, trying to identify what the solution is going to look like. You know, we put together the same thing. We we define our architectural requirements. You know, what are those critical components that, you know, we are going to implement as part of the overall solution and the architecture? Uh, we started looking into Gen I, that, you know, there can be comprehensive solution that can provide a user-centric uh, solution so that uh, our our employees, you know, no matter what device they're using, they can access this information. Uh, of course, you know, we wanted to make sure that we have a scalable infrastructure. That's something we are we are building, we are designing that can grow uh, as we are investing into this into this specific technology for Gen, Gen AI. More on the conversational side, uh, security and compliance, of course, you know, is a major component of this architecture and this design criteria. We want to make sure that the data we are we are providing is is something that's secure, that's in compliance. And it's the the whole accuracy. So when we when we started doing the testing and the the validation, you know, we wanted to make sure that we have integration with our existing systems, with our knowledge manage, management systems. So the the user experience and the trust into the answers and the replies coming back to them are intact and and, and accurate. So putting together the business requirements, putting together the architecture, you know, we started with uh, how do we really roll out and how do we make this available? So we started talking about, hey, what, what could be done as well as some of the low hanging fruit? So, you know, we picked our, our, uh, our operators and our mechanics, a smaller group, and we said, okay, you know, this is what we are trying to do. Uh, we want to make sure that we capture their feedback uh, and we launched a, a pilot, a very small pilot, and basically, we went through the whole data ingestion process, typical, you know, LLM, like, you know, what Will was talking about from the learning perspective, prompt engineering perspective, working with uh, with uh, Resolve, identifying the, the right solution that, you know, this is something that can fit into our, into our environment and uh, making sure that we have the proper integration with our service desk, you know, system so we can have the entire knowledge base. And uh, we started deploying this one with our with our pilot users and uh, start collecting their feedback. So it was a fairly iterative uh, cyclic process of launching slowly and gradually new features, new functions for this smaller group of pilot users and, and continuously improving the user experience and the accuracy and the prompt engineering to make sure that you know we have truly the natural natural language processing experience. So Really, this is the whole you know conversion point for us from from classic to to Gen AI. So, really coming from what if traditional typical you know the the chatbot sort of a technologies what we used to see two three four years ago. Now we are seeing a truly model base that's truly you know trained on our on our information on our data on our documents on our policies, and uh, you know we started getting fairly good feedback. So. Really, from the, these early events and these uh, iterative improvements, you know, we transition transition into the into the full uh, production rollout. And uh, again, you know, with uh, any sort of uh, production rollout, you know, you wanted to make sure that you have a you know incorporate all the feedback. You know, what we learned during this pilot, uh, communication is critical. So you know, we use all sorts of channels: uh, electronic, paper, uh, going into the meetings. Uh, talking about you know what this this uh, this whole uh, new channel is going to look like, uh, training staff on a regular basis, sending out the notific the emails and the updates and the messages, uh, but not only limiting the one way communication, but also establishing a feedback mechanism. So we know what what the set, what the feedback is, what the what the I guess the impression is from our from our employees. So. Having that sort of uh, feedback uh, for the for the, a, a successful adoption, I think it's very critical. You want to make sure that you have a true feedback channel open all the time. So, awareness, you know, as I talked about, uh, making sure that people understand, finding out those champions, you know, within our customer base and our user base, and uh, really promoting their success stories and uh, and and getting their testimonials for for the wider community to have that sort of a support and guidance. Uh, and, you know, we set up a help desk to make sure that we have the queries, we can answer those questions. And uh, I, I feel that, you know, we have been fairly successful in launching, we call ITAB. 
So in fact, you know, we had the we had the uh, a small you know uh, I guess sort of a survey done that you know hey what we want to really name over this uh, this chatbot or this service or this new channel which is now IT Amy and uh, if you come and talk to anyone in AC Transit you know you can find out that IT Amy is someone part of IT organization and available twenty four by seven and can respond to the questions and the queries so developing that sort of uh, infrastructure to make sure that people even who are coming on board uh, new employees they can interact uh, you know without any issue without any problem uh, and the whole uh, experience has been fairly frictionless when it comes to interacting with with IT Amy and we are continuously you know working in the back end uh, with resolve in improving that uh, that whole experience uh, so successful launch on the IT side, that's really where it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop. You know, we want to make sure that we continuously improving and continuously expanding this platform. Really, the vision is we want to take IT Amy and convert that IT Amy into truly Amy in the sense it's not only limited to IT, but it can also learn about the HR benefits, payroll. I mean, a lot of these other other. Uh, business units within AC Transit or or any other corporation, uh, they are looking for that kind of information. So, uh, so now actually we are uh, integrating into other HR system, into our ERP system. We're looking into payroll benefits, uh, but at the same time, as I said earlier, you always need to. We want to start with a smaller group of people uh, or our users, and that's where our focus has been. Uh, so we will be looking into further expansion. We are continuously doing the data mining. We're looking into the benefits. I mean, just uh, how many um, tickets, you know, we have been able to resolve, especially after hours, what I was not able to resolve before we launch IT Amy. So, and continuously getting the feedback from our user community, especially my frontline staff, uh, making sure that they have this thing available. We are also taking this interface and making it available for our uh, employee engagement uh, portal that's going to be all mobile. So, so we have you know fairly uh, uh, aggressive uh, you know plans uh, how we are going to incorporate uh, Gen AI technology into our into our business systems continuously integrating. Uh, but the but the success here is really more about making sure that we have a seamless uh, uh, experience for our for our users, no matter whether they're looking for help on IT password reset. Uh, device provisioning, uh, any workflow automation, uh, all the way to the HR payroll benefits. Amazing, amazing, fantastic, Asan. This is this is great. Uh, thank you, Will and Asan. I I want to ask a question to you guys. Uh, you know, um, the, especially in twenty twenty three, there was a lot of anxiety that people had about Gen AI. Right, Gen AI has gone through some kind of curve, as all of us know, um, and now things are settling down a little bit, but uh, Gen AI case studies are still very new, right? Asan, you must be among the first organizations to come out with uh, with the Gen AI case study where you actually implemented and seen the result. So uh, tell me a little bit about um, how do you deal with the anxiety around Gen AI? Uh, I would love to hear both from Will and, and Asan. Will, if you want to go first, maybe you can go first and then Asan. Yeah, happy to. Um, and good question. Uh, so... There is understandably still a lot of anxiety around this, but uh, as I hope some of the data presented earlier illustrates, demand for IT and demand for support, employee support in general, still far outstrips supply. When it comes to actually implementing these in an organization and from any org I've talked to who is even used some of the precursor systems, very rarely is there any sort of actual headcount reduction. Um, it might be something like a role isn't necessarily backfilled as quickly, uh, something akin to that, but more frequently what we see is actually an upscaling that is involved because as you've got less people having to handle the, just the shovel loads of password resets we get, um, Instead, you have people who need to be able to handle harder problems or more complicated or something that's a bit of an exception that you've never run into before because a brand new patch has just been deployed to the operating system and it's creating some interactions that no one's documented yet. So you need people who are more adaptable, more capable in order to deal with those. 
compared to, again, somebody who can just crank through dozens and dozens of password resets, but we don't usually see it resulting in a net headcount reduction. Fantastic. The, uh, Asan, you want to uh, give your view on that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, it's a very good question, Manish. I think you're right. Uh, I think the, the Gen AI, uh, I guess in 2023, uh, and of course, uh, credit goes to ChatGPT and, and OpenAI and uh, the launch. Uh, I think it's the it's the consumerization of this technology that, of course, uh, sort of a really accelerated the adoption among the consumers. But then when it comes from consumer to enterprise, I think it's the whole, that's where maybe I guess there is the, this anxiety or maybe there's some concerns and very rightfully should be there because I think when you're dealing with the enterprise, uh, you have number of different data sources and you have number of different buckets, right? And anytime you are trying to mesh any of the two data sources and trying to get the knowledge and the information out through Gen AI, uh, it, it does require quite a bit of data engineering. And yeah. that's where the whole data governance comes in and which is, you know, uh, foundation for the success of Gen AI. So uh, I think that that uh, that those concerns, Manish, I think you're talking about, uh, they are they are they are they are there, and I think they are for good reason. And uh, I think to put together uh, all the different components when it comes to Gen AI, from not only just from the accuracy perspective, the relevance perspective, but also the security and the ethics, right? There are a lot of those components are there. So you need to make sure that you have the the true. Uh, sure. comprehensive proper governance in place to understand and, and it cannot be just you know you 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 build something and then you leave it on its own uh, it, it does require constant uh i guess connectivity with that program to make sure that you are constantly monitoring the input and the output of the gen ai systems uh, absolutely absolutely and there are some questions pouring in and I'll welcome everyone to start, um, um, you know, sending the questions. What I'm going to do is though, I'm going to take around five to seven minutes to talk about um, Resolve.ai's uh, take on this solution. So this was great uh, setup on, on how will you describe the problem statement and where this is going. I want to show you what is available today from Resolve.ai, what is our situation? We are making like a, we, we are going to make it a customer story really, how this works out for an average person. So you already articulated what kind of problems everyone's seeing. We heard from Asan, we heard from uh, uh, Will. In terms of the problems that each of these uh, stakeholders in the service desk have, right? Like you talked about enterprise friction, Will, and we, I, I call it a term called process blindness, which is like, you want to get something done, but you don't know how to get it done. You don't know which system you need to log on to and then you need to go to some other system and who needs to approve it. This is process blindness. All of us have it. And why should we not? We are busy doing so much stuff. Should Am I also responsible for knowing all the processes that exist in this company? Uh, perhaps not. There should be a handing, uh, helping hand to help me and guide me to get this thing. It should not be me thinking of knowing all the systems uh, in, in now there. Similarly, from technician's perspective, you know, tickets are not complete. There's not contextual information. There's there's uh, not enough automation. I got to do everything manually. And there are too many tickets today morning, right? Monday morning, um, I think all of us know in service desk, um, after 4th of July, the first um, um, day after 4th of July, that's one of the peak uh, volume of tickets. Why? Right? Because everyone comes back after four day weekend or three day weekend and they don't remember their passwords, right? And and there you go, the volume shoots to the roof. Uh, similarly, from a service desk manager perspective, right? They want better visibility of patterns, like you were saying. They want to know, uh, you know, what is going on with technicians and what is going on with employees, right? What is the trend here? Um, uh, so they want a pulse uh, of the system, really. And as far as the C-level executive are concerns, I think the main thing is, are we getting the ROI on all the investments that we are making? So keeping that in mind, this is how it works with Resolve.ai um, you know, solution. It's, so as a user, you come in, you, um, you have an issue, it might be IT problem, it also might be HR problem or finance problem. And when you come in and you are coming to, you know, most likely when you use our system, you're going to come to Teams and you're going to ch chat to the uh, bot over there. 
uh, it is going to be completely conversational bot. Now, there are a couple of other options though. You can maybe even write an email and we have introduced now a Gen AI based email response. So Gen AI can read the email from a shared mailbox, uh, create a ticket in the right uh, place, right, uh, right location, suggest you knowledge articles and other suggestions that it has to make so that you can get a quick response within three to five seconds is when we are getting the responses and then you're good to go, right? So um, that's an amazing uh, breakthrough because you know when Gen AI can start responding to email in many organizations, there are a lot of emails floating around. Uh, that's a huge reduction in effort. Um, and especially if it creates a well-prioritized, well-documented uh, tickets. You can come by mobile app, you can come by web. There are really a lot of choices. And what we do is once the uh, information conversation starts, there are a lot of algorithm running on the back end. And these are doing something around conversational metrics. So we are measuring a lot of conversational metrics. What is the urgency? Uh, what is the sentiment? Is the customer feeling really bad at this point of time? What is the tone assessment? How clear is it what they're saying? And using all these metrics, what we do is we decide, start taking decisions, right? So. Like if someone comes and says, hey, uh, I, I met this accident. The first thing should be, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? Right? And stuff like that. Um, uh, communication calibration. What kind of communication you need to do? How? What is the priority of this issue? Is this really um, high priority issue? There's something needs to be done about it right away and stuff like that. And what is the effective problem triage? Right? So these are the kind of... Um, uh, you know, decisions which are made. And essentially five things can happen with the, with the problem at this point of time. You can get an answer from a knowledge source within enterprise, which is the very basic stuff. Uh, you can kick off a workflow or automation. You might create a ticket. You might bring an expert, human expert into the loop right away. You might get a notification or update uh, about a ticket existing situation. This is just informational uh, and you're not uh, talking to anyone. You're just trying to find a status. Now, once we do that, so there are, um, you know, uh, different sources. If we go dig through each one of them, um, from the knowledge perspective, we can go to SharePoint, we can go to internet website, you can uh, put Confluence, you can put documents, you can put service non-knowledge articles, whatever, wherever your knowledge is sitting, you don't need to move the knowledge, you can just point the bot to that knowledge and it will be able to read from that source and then start giving answers on the basis of that. Uh, furthermore, you can prioritize that go to this source first and go to that source second and 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 for this topic, this uh, this here should be a better information, right? So this is really important to decide how to provide an answer and that sophistication exists. When you get the answer, there's citations on the answers. There are embedded text uh, and also linked to the original article. And also there's a explainability, which is coming to our platform soon, which means that we'll be able to explain how the uh, how the entire answer uh, comes, right? So if there's an answer that you don't understand why this answer was provided by the bot, now you can go look up that it went here and searched here and then it went there and then it went there and therefore it found the answer. Um, you can start a automation, very important, because like Will said, you need to go beyond giving answers. Um, sometimes people want to get some stuff done, uh, like password research and whatnot, which is task automation. But you can also do complex things like, you know, I want to onboard an employee, right, um, which might involve five systems and three approvals. Um, and then there's something unique that we do, which is called desktop automation. And desktop automation means, um, you know, running ability to do things uh, at the desktop level. It really pushes the envelope of automation. And for example, if you say my OneDrive is not working, right? Now there's no need for a remote employee, for a technician to remote log into your desktop, solve the problem. Bot can run a few PowerShell scripts on your desktop and solve that problem, which is really next generation because anyone who has faced OneDrive issue knows that it takes around 10, 11 hours minimum for me uh, to get this because you know you will put it to service desk and someone will look at it make some sessions then you'll go back and say that didn't work out and then uh, then they will say okay someone else has to go and remote log into us tell us when it can be done and so on and so forth right so it takes some time another amazing thing that we love on our platform is approval on teams so that means if you if you're going through a workflow and someone needs to approve and let's say asan needs to approve something it will come to teams and on him and he can approve right there Creating a ticket is also not very simple in the sense you need to ask right follow-up questions to create what we call a smart tickets. 
you need to uh, and these smart follow-up questions can come on the basis of uh, you know tickets type right so there's a particular ticket type of moving a printer uh, moving an asset from one place to another so the bot can ask follow-up questions based on what ticket type it was right and that's really smart um, it can the bot can decide what is the priority and urgency of uh, the conversation based on the conversation which department it needs to go to which queue it needs to go to whether it's a service request or incident or change request it doesn't need to ask it knows where to what kind of issues go where and then it can go create a ticket it can create a ticket in either our own itsm system or it can go create a ticket into other itsm systems that exist um you know similarly there's a live chat feature when when you know you need to bring human into the loop right like maybe you don't want to chat with a bot or if there's some urgency or you know i was giving an example to someone i was discussing today morning Someone says, I, I'm facing sexual harassment. There's not an IT example, it's an HR example. In that situations, maybe you need to immediately bring a human into the loop, right? And those kind of situations, uh, that ability should also be there. Similarly, getting updates, you have a ticket update. Where, you know, what do you do about it, right? So you can get that update in Teams and send respond to that in Teams. You don't have to go to a portal or, or any place else to, or read an email to you. You don't know how to respond to that. You can just do everything in Teams and that makes things easier. I'm going to just go over what happens to technicians side of the story. And I'm going to go a little bit faster because technicians are also the biggest stakeholder. They need prioritized, completed tickets. They, they would love to have ticket summarization. If the ticket is bouncing around a few times, how do you summarize that ticket? They need access to their own knowledge base, which is not accessible to everyone else. Um, right? These kind of things. But like Will was saying, also, you know, patterns, right? Uh, can we tell them uh, that this kind of ticket has been created by Manish three times in last one month, right? So they can be ticket specific insights and knowledge. And can we tell them, listen, this is the recommended resolution plan based on your prior notes and how people have solved this ticket. Just imagine what it will do to a new technician that you have just hired in the organization and he or she does not have enough knowledge on your organization. Now the bot is helping them as they're going along solving the ticket in terms of how they can solve the ticket. And this, these kind of things are really uh, path breaking for us. Um, from a service desk management perspective, you, you are getting better control of the situation, better insights. You understand what is going on much better in real time. Uh, and from a, a C-suite executive perspective, essentially you are likely to not only get the investment ROI on the product that you're buying, Gen AI product, but actually it will have multiplier effect. It can affect the ROI of other systems that you already invested in and, and give you a better ROI. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause here um, because, you know, if you do all that, that results in happy, happy faces all around. Uh, technicians will be happy, CIOs will be happy, C-suite executives will be happy, and users will be happy. And, and that is what, um, you know, we are gunning towards. Uh, uh, we want to see smile on the face of people. We don't want to see that enterprise friction that people often experience. And there are huge dividends for this, right? The dividends of this go beyond uh, what a, a typical ROI Excel will tell you. Uh, I'm going to pause here um, and... Uh, and see if uh, there's, there were a bunch of questions, um, Will and Hassan. And I, I wonder if um, you can, uh, uh, I think you have answered some questions. Uh, Will, you want to mention some of the answers? You want to recap the, some of the answers uh, for the benefit of everyone that you've already answered? Very happy to, yes. Um, and so again, please, anybody who is still has something, has a burning question or is actively formulating one, please, punt this to us through the Q&A system. Um, we are actively watching. I'm trying to respond as fast as possible to the ones I can take here. Um, but uh, one of the first and fun ones is which LLM is most reliable according to Forrester? That is a very good question. Um, so we will, I should also note, I didn't have this in the initial response, but I will note we are working on a uh, wave later in the year. Um, I believe Rowan Curran is currently uh, drawn the short straw to I mean that one, but what we've found for most LLMs and when we're testing these and the actual in production use cases of them, uh, model competency and capability is 
improving across the board at a very high rate. Um, and so even if something didn't necessarily work a few months ago, chances are it might work for you today. But the best way to ensure a reliable answer from an LLM is through pursuing a um, response. I believe this is the what the acronym stands for. I'm just blanking on it, but a uh, response augmented generation or RAG, uh, because this allows you to directly inject concrete information into the generative response. And so sort of going back to one of my earlier points here for a generative system, generative is only part of this. You need the ability to understand what the person is asking. Um, that's usually some LLM as well. Uh, you need the ability to identify what the resolution path for that is and what the relevant knowledge is for that. And you don't want all of this being managed exclusively by the LLM itself. And uh, this is in part why we're starting to see stuff like multi-model orchestration or um, not necessarily having a, or a system and not having a concrete opinion on which model to use at a given time, instead letting the users ask, dictate how they are dispatching that request. Uh, and we're seeing that becoming very quickly the de facto approach using both RAG as well as in the multi-model orchestration in order to build a more resilient system and more reliable, most importantly, one. And Bill, if I, if I may add here, uh, just real quick that, um, we actually are, not only we have 20 plus different LLM models today that we offer to clients, depending on what they are really looking for, right? From Cloud to Google Vortex to whatnot. But also in some situations, we have deployed multiple LLMs doing different part of the job in the same deployment. So for example, for answering questions, maybe 4.0, um, um, you know, OpenAI, but for, for uh, GPT 4.0, but for action taking, there's a different LM because it is doing that part better. So what is likely to emerge according to us is not only ability to select one um, statically, but also dynamically. At the same time, you can perhaps um, use different models for different things. And there's already something that we are doing. Well said. Um, another question we got, what are the advantages and uh, do we see faster implementation of a general system in orgs that have more robust knowledge management, such as KCS? Uh, it, my answer here is it makes life much easier for organizations. It's not everything you need. And as you get more advanced with your use cases, the information management and reconciliation problem gets much more difficult. Um, I, I, I very quickly flashed up one of those slides as I was trying to try to, uh, get to the end of my session, uh, section there. Um, but what you're going to need to do is be able to reconcile information from not just stuff like an ITSM knowledge base, but then also from Teams messages, from uh, maybe a CRM, maybe your SharePoint or whatever sort of information repository you've got. Uh, you're going to need to reconcile all of these points of information. This becomes easier if your information is already well managed. And we see most organizations now spinning up one of these capabilities internally because they've been um, lax in most organizations with implementing these systems, or even if you're doing KCS in one part of the organization, it's not necessarily translated to all different parts of it. So it's a yes, but answer there. Perfect. There are a couple of more questions here. I'm, I mean, we have one or two minutes. So if any questions that you can pick up, um and and answer that'll be great there's still five six questions it's amazing this session has been great people are asking a lot of questions very engaged um session um oh and i see spirit reducing friction is federated environment with multiple bot, bot products with bot to bot handoff achievable yes we're seeing that today um this is a little bit more experimental and it can depend again on the different competencies of the different bots uh, but we were seeing bot to bot handoffs as well as bot versus bot which is the way more entertaining version of that for me, um, where we've actually seen people employing their own individual LLM enabled things to go and negotiate with other bots to go and decipher um, usually stuff like contracting. Uh, so that is a fun emergent use case, but yes, bot to bot handoff is possible. Um, uh, we also have a cost question, Manish, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I mean, typically, um, you know, these models are per employee per month kind of basis where you're aggregating, assuming a demand and then charging on the basis of that. 
uh, that leaves at least our, our model and it's we have tried to keep it very reasonable because we do believe that uh, you know roi is the king at the end of the day right if you cannot go and tell your boss that listen i invested in this technology and 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 this is the roi at the end of year one i'm not talking about end of year five then I think you are going to get in trouble sometime or the other, no matter how fancy the technology is. So uh, happy to have a pricing discussion with whoever wants it, but it's really based on number of employees per month and, and maybe uh, a mixture of if you're trying to do many departments, it might be more, but it's per employee per month. And uh, Son, in the last minute here, we've got a question for you. Um, yeah, how much so time did your, trans uh, did your pilot take? Yeah, pilot, we, so this is the whole thing that started during COVID. So this is, I think we, we took about six months to, to do the whole data ingestion, design, architecture uh, process, uh, about six months. And then, you know, from there, we went to live with the production system. Yeah. And this was, Asan, I, want, I must point out, you were in the very early stage of Gen AI system, right? When we were, uh, you were among the first customers uh, from our site who started to go towards Gen AI. And since then... Right things have become faster, like earlier for knowledge source uh, ingestion, it used to take us a little bit time. But right. nowadays, it's um, it's uh, we are going live with as soon as uh, two months or even one month um, uh, going live with that. So uh, listen, we are towards the end of the hour. We can stay on if it's okay with you and answer some more questions. We can also take all these questions and maybe publish a question and answer for everyone if that's okay. And I we, we can make sure that you get it in the email um, response. Is that okay? Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed that conversation, Manish. Thank you so much. Hey, Will. Really always fun to listen to you. Likewise. Thank you for having us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Appreciate everyone's time.